Thanks, Jesper. Uh, well, my name is Richard, and uh, I'll have the pleasure and the privilege of speaking to you from that part of the Word of God. Now, it is the Word of God. Incidentally, when Rod introduced himself, I thought he said, hello, my name is God, uh, but, but it was Rod. Uh, but this is the Word of God, and it has supernatural ability. It really does. And because there's such gravity around this Word of God, indeed any section of the Word of God, we need to handle it carefully. And so I'm actually going to ask God to help me to do just that, because I really think it's that important. I'm going to also ask God to help us to listen well and to respond appropriately. So if you're the praying kind, please join me. Otherwise, just listen in. We thank you, dear Father, for the privilege it is to gather here this afternoon. Indeed, those of us online as well, wherever we are watching from, whether even overseas or here in this building, please, Father, speak to us from your word. Help me to teach it well. Please help us to listen well. And please help us to respond in a manner that is pleasing to you. And we pray this for your sake. Amen. Well, he was born in a dumpy, rural, hick town. I'm sure if he was... Walking the earth today, he'd be wearing a flannelette shirt as well. Ugg boots to match. He was born to a teenage mother, lived in relative obscurity until about the age of 30, working a blue-collar job. But the legacy of his life makes him one of the most popular figures of all time. Apparently, more books have been written of him more songs have been sung of him, more paintings have been painted of him than any other person in history. And he is, of course, Jesus, the Christ. Now, Rod asked about the one thing to consider, and here is the one thing, that Jesus is the Christ. Not only understanding what that means, but responding to this understanding is the big thing to take away from tonight. Now I'll explain what this means in a moment, but what do you think of Jesus? How do you see Jesus, as it were? It may be that you've grown up in a family that calls themselves Christian and you think you know it all. It may be that you're coming to church for the first time, watching for the first time. Maybe that you're just investigating, you know, something. But wherever you are in that spectrum, what do you really think about Jesus? Now, just imagine you've come home from a 21st birthday party and you're getting a little bit bored because you've exhausted everything that you want to look at on TikTok, you've exhausted everything on Instagram. So you've got to go really lame and look at Facebook now. Right? And then you finally discover that your friend has actually uploaded all these photos from the 21st that you've been at. And you start scrolling through all the photos. Now, be really honest. As you scroll through the photos, who are you really looking for? Hey? Is it really the person who's had the 21st? You're really looking for yourself, aren't you? In fact, you're trying to work out how many smiley faces or kisses or something there are on the photo that you're in, right? So you're looking for yourself in those photos, aren't you? Well, I want us to scan two or three photos tonight from this passage, as it were. Photos of various people, but I want you to work out whether you could see yourself in the various photos. Facebook photo number one, the ordinary people of the land. From the passage of scripture that was read out for us, 
we read of the disciples, right? those who were seeking to learn from Jesus, and they're wandering around some villages with Jesus. And we pick it up in verses 27 and 28 that you'll see coming up on the screen, I think. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Now please note, these people were the ordinary people of the land. right? And they saw Jesus in a particular way, indeed, as one of the great prophets. Now, a prophet is someone who spoke the word of God, knew what God had revealed to him, and he passed it on to others, as it were. So they're very, very esteemed people. And they saw Jesus as one of these great prophets. In fact, some of them thought they were particular prophets. John the Baptist, for example. He was a man who wandered around the wilderness in the days of Jesus. Indeed, he was wearing camel's hair, leather belt around his waist, and he would go around eating wild locusts and honey. Incredible kind of guy. He's like the Hagrid of the New Testament, right? If you have ever read that book, although many people just watch the movies, he's kind of that big and that hairy, as it were. Sounds like him. Crowns, crowds come from all over the Middle East to hear his teaching about Jesus, right? But then others think he's like Elijah. Now, Elijah was like the foreshadow figure of John the Baptist, except he happened to be around 900 years before Jesus. And Elijah did great miracles. In fact, he even parted the sea at one point. He even uh, managed to raise someone from the dead. In fact, he himself didn't die because there was a chariot of fire right, that swooped down and picked him up and took him into heaven. Now, that's amazing, isn't it? And so people thought he was either John the Baptist or Elijah. And please note, they didn't think he was like them. They thought he was Elijah come back from the dead, or he was John the Baptist come back from the dead, or that he was one of these great prophets who had come back from the dead. That's how incredibly esteemed, the esteem that they gave to this one called Jesus. Now I want to ask, having seen that photo, can you see yourself in that photo? That is, you may not even have heard of John the Baptist or Elijah or even the word prophet, but you have a positive view of Jesus, a really, really positive view of Jesus. Maybe that you think he's a great moral teacher, someone of great influence. In fact, you may even come from another religion. You may be a Muslim or a Hindu and, or whatever other religion it may be, but you know, Jesus is highly esteemed in every single religion of this world. Very highly esteemed. Do you hold a very positive view of Jesus? A very sincere and positive view of Jesus? Now for all the sincerity that we have, please note that sincerity doesn't necessarily equal truth. You can be very sincere but sincere about the wrong thing. I know of a doctor who shared the story of a particular woman who married to her husband, used to help her husband who was suffering from diabetes. And she used to help him out by giving him his dosage of medication that was required. She gave his medication day in, day out, day in, day out, but one day for some reason she gave him the wrong dosage and because of his particular circumstances of life and health it killed him incredibly tragic story isn't it do you think for a moment she wasn't sincere oh she was sincere but she was sincerely wrong so wrong that it led to the death of her husband See, truth really matters, not just sincerity, but truth. Could you be this photo? Could you hold a really positive view of Jesus, a very sincerely positive view of Jesus, but be so sincerely wrong that it might actually lead to grave consequences?
Well, that's Facebook photo number one. What about Facebook photo number two? Here we learn of Peter, the disciple who led the 12 disciples, as it were. In verse 29, we read these words of Jesus to Peter. Where Jesus says, but what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ. The Christ. And here we come to the one thing that you need to remember tonight. Please note that the word Christ is not the surname of Jesus. You don't go to the white pages on Google and then work out that it goes Adams, Burke, Chin, Christ. Please note the proximity of chin to Christ in the alphabet there. It's very important, important fact to work out. Not the thing, but pretty close there, right? Chin, Christ. What is the Christ in the Greek, which is the original language of the New Testament part of the Bible? It's synonymous with the word Messiah, which is from the Hebrew in the Old Testament part of the Bible, which is the same as the English term, the anointed one. They're all synonymous terms, right? But the Christ is a title. It's a title like senator, a prime minister, president, lord, king. The Christ or Messiah is the title over them all, as it were. And it means the lord of lords, the one who is the king of kings, the president of presidents. The one who rules over all. In other words, Jesus reigns supreme over every mountain and every molecule. He reigns supreme over every galaxy and every garden. He reigns supreme over every planet and every person. He rules. He reigns. He, he's Lord. He's the Christ. He alone can stop the pandemic. No one else can. They can make promises of a vaccine, but even then it's not going to work, is it? Only, only Jesus is the one who rules and reigns and has our lives in his hands. So every breath that we take comes from God. So that breath, and that breath, that yawn up the back, no, 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 all came from Jesus. He's the Christ. He is the Christ. And Peter answered rightly, you are the Christ. And here is perhaps one of the greatest moments in history when someone recognizes him to be who he really is, the Christ. And then Jesus goes on to explain what he will do as the Christ. In verses 31 and 32, we read these words, he, that is Jesus, then began to teach them, the disciples, including Peter, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Alongside one of the greatest moments in history is one of the greatest blunders in history. Imagine that. Peter says, you are the Christ, you're the Lord, you're the King of Kings, you know everything. But suddenly he says, well, but you don't know everything, you shouldn't be saying that, so let me take you aside and rebuke you. You see how great a blunder there is at the same time? He kind of gets it right, but then he doesn't get it right. He's effectively saying, what, Jesus? If you are the Christ, if you are the King who reigns over everything and everyone, how can you be rejected and killed? It doesn't make sense. You don't know what you're talking about, so let me take you aside and correct your thinking for a moment, Jesus. And so we read Jesus' response in verse 33, but when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Peter, the leader of the disciples, he gets it right initially because he spent three years with Jesus by this time. 
He saw Jesus feed thousands. He saw Jesus calm the raging storm. He saw Jesus exorcise demons from people. He saw Jesus raise people from the dead. He saw Jesus do all these things. And yet, he still doesn't see Jesus properly. He still doesn't get it. And Jesus sees Peter's rebuke as being in line with Satan rather than in line with God. Could you be in this photo? Perhaps you too have a right understanding of who Jesus is. He's the Christ. You know, perhaps you've grown up in churches and families and you've read Bibles and you know the answer all the time, no matter what they say. You know the answer is Jesus. You know the answer is Christ. You go, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I've heard that, Richard. I've heard that. Yeah, he's the Christ. I get it. You know, to the point where you know the answer is always Jesus in a Sunday school kind of questionnaire, don't you? You know, what's grey and in trees and eats um, eucalyptus leaves and so on? You might think, well, the answer straight away, you know, it's Jesus. Sounds like a koala, but it's Jesus, right? That's what you, you'll answer straight away. It's Jesus. But, do you really get it? Perhaps you too, even though you've understood that Jesus is the Christ, you feel a little disillusioned. Oh, sure, he's the Christ, but we're in the middle of a pandemic at the moment. What gives? Oh, sure, you're meant to be in charge, but what about the little racial tensions that we see in the United States at the moment, let alone other places of the world? What about the tensions with China? Or what about the personal heartache that I have regarding health? Or loved ones dying? Or relationships breaking down? And I feel like Jesus hasn't done anything about that. Oh, yeah, he's the Christ. But you don't see him as your Christ. I'm coming along because my friends come along. Seems like the right thing to do, but I'm really not sure within. I'm just faking it until it looks like as if it's real. Could that be you? Because if that's you, please note why Jesus had to suffer and die and rise again. He came to rescue us from what all this suffering is symptomatic of, namely our offense against God. And the Bible calls that sin, which is best understood by the way it's spelled. Right? It's a small s, a huge I in the middle, and then a small n. It's got to do with I, I, me, me running to run my own life, my own way, without Jesus as my Christ, without Jesus as my Lord, without Jesus as number one of my life. I give lip service to Jesus. I'll call him the Christ, but he's not actually number one. He's not actually ruling my life, even though I might pretend he is, but he's not actually ruling it. Because I'm running my life. I want to run it my way. But you might think, oh no, that sounds like someone who's really, really rebellious. I'm actually doing good things, right? I'm being an obedient child, perhaps. I'm, I'm being someone who actually obeys the laws. I'm, I'm here, you know, wearing a mask as well. I'm sanitizing and so on. I'm doing everything by, you know, in every way. I'm doing the right thing here. And, and everybody knows that I'm trying to do the right thing. And everybody can see, and I'm really a good, moral, upright citizen society. I might even give money to charity, help the old lady across the road being an outstanding citizen in every way. I know of a doctor in Perth who was a very, very good doctor, and, and he chose to give up everything in his wonderful life in Perth in order to go to the Middle East to help people who are in need. A very compassionate man, helping people there who were in need, and he did wonderful things. But here's the thing. The people he was helping were from ISIS. You get what's going on there? 
He's very compassionate, very kind, helping people in need. But what really matters is the flag that he flies under. And if he's flying under the flag of ISIS, then he's actually an enemy to those that ISIS is an enemy of. See, what matters is what flag you fly under. What matters is who is number one of your life. Because if, if you're doing all these wonderful, good things, then if you're still flying under your flag, but not under the flag of Christ, then that makes you an enemy of Christ, no matter how good you are. Do you see? But Jesus, nevertheless, came to take upon himself the judgment that we deserve as his enemy. He came to die for his enemies. Even though we deserve the anger of God, all the anger of God that should have been poured out on you and me as his enemies was turned aside from us unto Jesus to give us the opportunity to be saved, to be rescued so that we could live with Jesus as number one. That's what it means to see Jesus properly. See, do you see Jesus properly that way? At the beginning of our reading today, did you notice that funny two-staged miracle that Jesus performed? There was a blind man that was taken to Jesus, and Jesus spits in the man's eyes, right? Very non-COVID thing to do, huh? Right. He spits in the man's eyes, and then he rubs the man's eyes, and you think, yeah, he's got the healing done. But then the man opens his eyes and he says, uh, what, can you, you know, what can you see? And he says, I, I see people, but they look like trees walking around. And then Jesus does the same thing, puts his hands on the man's eyes again, and then he can see properly. It's a two-stage miracle. It's weird, isn't it? If you're, if you're used to reading the Bible, you can, Jesus kind of does things kind of on the spot ordinarily, but here it takes two goes. Why is that two goes? Is it because he didn't have enough wheat picks that morning? Is it that he was just off his healing game that morning? No, it's because it's actually an illustration of what's taking place in the entire section of this part of the biography of Mark regarding Jesus. You see, here's the lesson of the two-stage miracle. Our eyes can be opened to see who Jesus is, like Peter, he's the Christ. But until we understand the radical implications of his death and resurrection, our eyes are not fully opened. We do not see Jesus properly. See, that was Peter's problem. His eyes were not fully opened. Could you possibly be in this photo? You see that Jesus is the Christ. You know that he is the Christ. You might even believe that he's the Christ. But do you live for him as the Christ? As number one of your life? Because if you do see him properly as the Christ who has saved you, then listen to how we ought to respond to the Christ. Verse 34, Then Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. To follow Jesus involves denying yourself, taking up your cross. To take up your cross is to die, basically. Is to carry the the cross beam on your shoulders as you were led out to crucifixion. But what does it mean to deny yourself in so doing? Well, if you read verse 36 and following, it says, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? What can anyone give in exchange for their soul. See, to deny myself is to deny gaining the whole world. It's to deny gain, gaining for me, gaining for my security, gaining for my reputation, gaining for my wealth, gaining for my sake. 
And what is in that bucket list of gaining? Well, maybe it was travel or the high status job or the expensive toys. Maybe it's a sport. Maybe it's a skateboard. Maybe it's a car. Maybe it's a... What is it? Maybe it's a girlfriend or boyfriend. Maybe it's a spouse. Anybody here know how to trap a monkey? And if you were here this morning, you're not allowed to answer. Just wondering, just put up your hand if you know how to trap a monkey. Anybody know? Okay, but you were here this morning, weren't you? I'm sure you were. I can tell you were. You have that I've been here this morning look around you, right? How do you trap a monkey? Well, this is what I was told. Apparently, it's like getting food into a birdcage that a monkey would like, so a banana or whatever it is, and... The monkey puts its hand inside the birdcage, grabs the food, but when it makes the fist, it can't fit through the birdcage anymore. It's kind of stuck there. And so the only way the monkey can survive is by denying itself the food to get its hand out. But if it wants to hang on to the food and gain the whole banana, it can lose its life. What's the gain that you want? It really could be one of those things, couldn't it? I was speaking to someone this morning and for them it was a particular relationship. It's just that, that person. I just couldn't, couldn't live without But it felt like that for me at a point. Uh, if you don't already know the story, uh, I've been married twice, actually. I have my beautiful Jeanette, my wife now, of four years. Four years last Thursday, thank you very much. But before that, seven years ago, I had a wonderful wife named Bronwyn. We were married for 24 years. And towards her last days she wanted to keep us pointed to Jesus and my family and I saw her take a last breath I can remember in days after that just grieving so much I can remember one point where it just felt like so much that I just curled up into a ball under a shower just wept I felt like I emptied Warragamba Dam in the process Felt like I couldn't live on at points. But you see, I knew that Bronwyn didn't want that because she wanted us, myself, our dear children, to live for Jesus as number one. And if we couldn't live on, that would have meant that she effectively became our Christ our Lord, our Saviour. But she didn't want that. So she prayed for us. And her prayers have been answered in so very many ways. Because by the absolute grace of God, each of our family members actually do live with Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. But what about you? There's nothing special about us in living that way. It's only because of what God has done, and we don't deserve that one iota. If you knew any of us, and knew me especially, you'd know that there's no way I deserve this at all. But where are you at? Is there a functional Christ in your life, functional Savior in your life, that you feel like without this person or this thing I just can't live life anymore what is it? is it is it reputation is it what your friends think of you is it the sport the car the job the whatever it is 
Because those of us who are saved by Jesus the Christ, well, indeed, we'll live this particular way, won't we? Look, look at verse 34 again. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. See, we can live with lip service that Jesus is the Christ as if we're in the center of our solar system and so you know, there's the job around us. But Jesus kind of circles us and he's there to help me get through life. He's there as my servant to help me you know, feel happy this day. He's there to help me get a good job and he's here to help me get a good spouse and he's here to help me do well in my sport and he's here to help me get high distinctions in my course and he's here to... But it should be the other way around. If we actually understand that he is the Christ, that means Jesus should be at the center of our solar system. And therefore, we revolve around him. In fact, our leisure time, our work time, our study time, our relationships, everything revolves around Jesus and his plans and his purposes. Do you see? That's the difference where he's the Christ. To take up your cross means losing our lives for Jesus Living as if it is better to die than to lie. Better to die than to steal. Better to die than to commit adultery. Better to die than to be ashamed of Jesus. This means being willing to live and die for Jesus because that is the absolute best way to live even though it means suffering en route. But it really is the best way to live because he made us and he is the Christ. There is a sister in Christ that I've shared the story of a few occasions this weekend. Her name is Rosaria Butterfield. Just Google that name if you've never heard of it and, and check out her story because, you see, she used to be a high-paid professor of literature in a top-tier university in the United States and a lesbian who was in a relationship with her lover in a house they had bought together with dogs and living a high life and in a community of gay and lesbian people who really cared for each other and would actually care for each other in a way that would make us as a church sometimes look almost paling into insignificance compared to how they really cared for each other. That's her testimony. But one day after reading the Bible about seven times she came to know Jesus as the Christ. And so she gave up everything. And as she says in her book, all she had was the car and the dog. That's it. She gave up everything to live with Jesus as the Christ. And now she's married to a pastor, adopted children, and continues to tell people about Jesus in magnificent ways. And I can't commend her more highly than anything that she's written I think is always worth reading that's what it means to follow Jesus do you really follow Jesus is he really your saviour and Christ because if you're not sure can I plead with you to find out more maybe read a biography of Jesus like the gospel of Mark I talk to others who have brought you along this evening Find out more online through ways that Rod will actually share with us about a little bit later. But it just may be that tonight you know all of this is true. But you haven't actually turned to Jesus as your Christ. And if that's you, and you know that it's true... And you know that you want to respond rightly, then the best way to do that is to actually speak to God about it, to pray. And I've written a prayer that'll be coming up on the screen that's a very simple prayer that just captures some of these ideas. Now, there's nothing magical about the words, but I want to read it to you before inviting you to pray it with me. It goes like this, Dear Father, please forgive me for not seeing Jesus properly. Please forgive me for ignoring him as the Christ. Thank you that he lived and died to take the punishment that I deserve. 
And please enable me to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow Jesus as the Christ from now on. You see the words? They're just ideas that the words capture. But if you pray this prayer to God our Father, He will answer. And if you know this to be true, and if you know this is you, then can I invite you to pray this prayer with me now? What I'm going to do is to pray this prayer sentence by sentence. And if it's your prayer, I'm going to invite you to echo it in your head and your heart to God in silence. And I know that God will answer. So please pray with me if this is your prayer. Dear Father, Please forgive me for not seeing Jesus properly. Please forgive me for ignoring him as the Christ. Thank you that he lived and died to take the punishment that I deserve. Please enable me to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow Jesus as the Christ from now on. Amen. The word amen simply means I mean it. If you meant that, can I assure you that God has answered? And we'd love to hear from you and we'd love to connect with you and Rod will share with us a bit later how it is that we can do that. All of what Jesus did revolves around the cross. So please listen carefully to these words as our musos bring us this song.